Welcome to Community Church, and thanks so much for tuning in online. We hope that you enjoy today's message and are encouraged through your time here today. No matter who you are or what's going on in your life, know that we are so glad you're here. Well, good afternoon, Community Church. So glad to be with you guys this weekend, kicking off family values. And I just, just want to start off with this, that, uh, you know, it's a privilege to be able to come and, and share with Pastor Michael Megan, and give me the opportunities to come and share with you guys on the weekend. But it always seems like every week leading up to a weekend where I'm going to speak, something goes completely different than what I expect. And uh, so this last week kind of started with some friends asking us if we would dog sit for them, uh, which yeah, is great, no problem. So they bring the dog over and then we learn that the dog likes to find every possible way to get out of the house and run into every neighborhood possible in Chesapeake uh, so we can chase them down. Uh, so that was fun. And then uh, that wasn't really, you know, we, we kind of got used to that. And then, and then the power goes out and we don't have power. And, and then school's canceled so all the kids are home. And it just kind of kept going from there. And so my Friday where I thought would be, hey, focus in for the weekend. Everybody's at school and nobody's around. Turned into just a little bit of chaos. But it all worked out pretty good. Uh, the power is back on. I'm excited about that at our house. The dog is doing well. The kids uh, are alive. They made it through the weekend in the power outage with us. The wife still has her sanity. So all in all, things are good, and I'm excited about today. And so I'm uh, going to kick off family values. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So let me pray, and then we're going to jump right into it. So God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the incredible work we know you want to do here in this place today. And for all those listening, God, I ask right now that you would speak into our hearts, God, directly what we need to hear, that we would receive it today, hear your voice for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to kick off family values. Her Pastor Michael talking about a couple values we're going to go through today. And we're going to start off in Luke 19. There's a story I want to, I want to share with you. It's going to kind of be the backdrop that we'll learn so much from for the couple values we're going to talk about here today. And so leading up to this passage, basically what has happened is, is Jesus has been going around and doing ministry. And during this time, he's been doing a lot of miracles and healing and things like that. So his name's becoming very well known. And we pick it up in Luke 19, verse 1. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus, and he called him by name Zacchaeus. He said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He, he has gone to the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. <laughs> Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord. He said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people out of their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. And so we're going to use this story as a backdrop and understanding in this moment, here's this, here's this guy, Zacchaeus, who, who's just a, a tax collector. He, he's a cheater. He's, a, he's kind of a thief. And he's kind of gone away. He's made himself rich off of other people. And he hears Jesus is coming. And he's heard a lot about him. So he just wants to get kind of this glimpse of what's all the fuss about this guy named Jesus. And so as he goes to look, there's this crowd. And he can't even see through it. So he runs and gets into a tree to get a better look. And I love, I'm going to read verse 5 for you again because I love what happens in verse 5. Here's Jesus. This crowd's forming around him. It says, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said. And I think about that in this moment. Here's Jesus traveling from city to city. He's in a main city with major crowds coming around him. And yet someone who just wants to get a glimpse at him throughout the whole crowd, Jesus notices him, calls him by name, and says, hey, let me spend the rest of my day with you today. And, and I think about this story and I go, man, this is so awesome that if all of us would capture in our hearts what's really happening in this moment, that for every one of us, this is a true thing. It's one of the values that we're going to talk about uh, here at Community Church. And as Pastor Michael said, it's not, it's not values we made up. They're, they're God's values that we just want to live out. And here it is. Every number has a name and every name matters to God. Every number has a name and every name matters to God. And when I look at this story, I'm going, there's crowds of people. And yet there's one guy who just wanted to see who this guy Jesus was. He looks up and he calls him by his name. And what I tell you, 
What Jesus was doing in that moment is something he does for us each and every day. That every day Jesus sees each and every one of us and he calls us by name and he's asking every day, would you let me be a part of your life? Would you let me be a part of your life? And, and, I, and I go, I think about this idea and I go, maybe, you know, we struggle with that because I think a lot of us are people who go, well, I don't know if Jesus sees me. I'm sure Jesus doesn't notice me out of the billions of people in the world. Why would he notice me? Jesus said, I came to seek and save those who are lost. He said, I came. I gave my life so that you could have life and you could have it to the fullest is what the Bible says. He says, I came. I noticed each and every one of you. And when I look at this value and what it means for us to understand, every number has a name and every name matters to God. Here's what I think we learn about Jesus from this story and what it goes on to know the most important thing in the world to the God who created it is us. Out of everything he's ever done, out of everything he could see, it's, it's us as individuals that matters most. I love this in Luke 12, 6 and 7. It says, what is the value of your soul to God? Could your worth be defined by any amount of money? God doesn't abandon or forget even the small sparrow he has made. How then can he forget or abandon you? What about the seemingly minor issues of your life? Does that matter to God? Of course they do. So you never need to worry for you are more valuable to God than anything else in this world. You are more valuable to God than anything else in this world. We need to know that that is a true statement for each and every one of us, that every number, you are a number right now in some kind of way, whether it's in the place you're sitting, the work you go to, the family you're a part of, you are a number in some kind of way, but every number has a name and you matter to God. That is a truth from his word. And when we think about this idea of numbers, sometimes we can get it all mixed up, but Jesus never has. Here's what I would tell you. Jesus wants to reach the one, and that means everyone. That's what he came for. He wants to reach the one. Jesus is always after the one. You know who that one is? It's you, and it's me, and it's everyone that's ever had life. He wants to reach them. He wants to show them a better life. He wants to be a part of the life he's given them. And I love this idea that when we hear God uh, just, we're the most important thing to him in the entire world. And, and some of us may sit here going, well, that's not me. I don't know if that, he doesn't see me, doesn't notice me. That even the angels in heaven understand this truth. It says in Luke 15, 10, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Think about this. When the truth that you matter to God sets into somebody's heart, enough that they go, man, I get it now. You're God and I'm not, and I need you in my life. And if I would just trust you, then I would experience more of the life that you created me to have, that I can't do life apart from you in any kind of way that is significant, but with you, I can do all things through, through you who gives me strength. If I could understand that and trust you. It says the angels in heaven throw a party over your life. Think about that. That's how much God cares about you. That's how much God cares about me. That in the moment when I go, okay, God, I get it. I want to do life your way. The angels in heaven are throwing a party going, yes, yes, he did it for them and they got it and they see it now. Yes. And they're so excited for you. I hear all the time, like, Oh, we're just a church about numbers. And, and I, you know, I think it's fair to answer that question today. Are we a church about numbers? Yes, <laughs> because every number has a name and names are people and people matter to God. So yes, we're about numbers because they matter because God says they do. And we're about what God says is important. And he says people are the most important thing. And in that moment in your life where you come to this realization of who God is and his love for you and that following him is the greatest decision you could ever make, then it only makes sense, and the Bible would show us this over and over again, that because of this understanding, that my heart would turn toward others more than myself. That because now I understand that God loves me the way he does, I must live a life that others can know it too. I want them to understand the same truth that I've come to experience. Think about it like this. When we realize our name matters to God, then every name should matter to us. When we realize that our name matters to God, every number should matter to us. We should never be in a place where we go, I get it. Hey, I'm following Jesus. Things are, you know, he's working in my life. It's great. And then there's all the other people, well, they're in my own problem. No, they are. They are. Why? Because every number has a name and every name matters to God. You realize right now we have, we have three campuses in Hampton Roads. 
But a very conservative number would tell us that there's at least a million people just in Hampton Roads right now that don't know they matter to God. There's at least a million people just right now within our seven cities that don't know they matter to God. That's sad. It's heartbreaking to know they're going through life missing out on the one who created them and the life that he has for them. So it takes us that have gotten to a place where we understand that to make sure that they know and to share that good news with them. That's why we hear things all the time. We say, invite somebody, be a bringer. Invite somebody, be a bringer. Why? Because we want them to come to a place where they can hear that Jesus loves them and he sees them and he knows their name and he's calling out to them and he has a purpose for their life. And we all get to be a part of that. I think about Zacchaeus' life and and he was short, and I'm sure in that moment, he's like, I just want to get a glimpse of him, but because he was short, he was probably thinking, maybe I'm never going to see this Jesus, or Jesus will never see me. And I was thinking through and praying this last week, I, I wonder how many of us think that something's happened in our life or about us that keeps God from seeing us, that we believe that we can't be seen by God either. And here's what I want to tell you. There is nothing that has ever happened in your life and nothing that you have ever done and nothing you will ever do that will disqualify you, disqualify you from God's love. It can't happen. There's nothing that will disqualify you from God's love. He loves you. You are the most important thing to him in the world. There is no, you're never going to have enough money. You're never going to have the, enough of the right friends. You're never going to have enough of the right success. You're never going to wear enough of the right clothes. You're never going to do enough of the right things. It's nothing about what you do. It's about who you are. You are God's and he loves you and he wants to do something miraculous in your life each and every day. That's the truth we should hold on to. That's what he wants for us. And so we get to live this out. How do we help others know the same amazing truth that God has revealed to us? And there's so many ways to do that. That's why we talk about serve teams around here. It's just an easy way to be a part of something that's bigger than yourself so that other people can experience the love of Jesus. I mean, whether it's, whether it's from the people that are helping in the parking lot, when people are walking in, you'd be amazed and just smile, wave, boys. How you doing today? Smile, wave, right? That, that, what that might do to somebody that just needs to see a smile and know that they're being noticed that day. Whether they're walking in and somebody's at the door greeting you or their kids are having an incredible kids experience and they're learning about Jesus and, or you come into the auditorium and you hear a song that just moves on your heart or a message that speaks to you or, or whatever it may be, that something happens that day where God can show up and speak directly into somebody's heart and make them know, hey, you know what? We see you. You are significant. You matter and God loves you and it will change their life. That's why we do what we do. It's why we do it as a church each and every week because it matters. Zacchaeus had an encounter with Jesus and everything changed for his life. Everything changed. He went from being this thief and this cheater just to get more money and being greedy to being somebody who stopped seeing value in money and started seeing value in people in one day. In one day with Jesus, he stopped seeing the value of money and started seeing the value of people. I'll give away half what I have, Lord. Well, whoever I've cheated, and we all know he already did, whoever I cheated, I'll give him four times as much back. And God's like, good. Because <laughs> you realize it's not about you anymore. It's amazing what God can do in the life of someone when we understand that he sees us and he knows us and he has plans for us. You could be a greedy cheater. You could be an unselfish giver. The difference is Jesus. And we need to live a life where we know that's true for us, but that we can help make it true for others. And we want to live that out. The reason I love this story is just so powerful. Uh, it's just such, such a powerful story, even though it's been made to be so simple. Uh, it's because I can relate to it. And I like to relate to simple things. <laughs> I'm a simple guy. And I like to relate to it. And, and I think about, here's Zacchaeus, who, who's just this tax collector, and he's living life the way he thinks he should live it. God's not even a part of this. But then he has an encounter with Jesus, and everything changes. And we're in this series, Family Values, and of course it makes you think about, you know, your, your, your family that you live with, and think about my family growing up, and, and the values that we had as a family growing up. And here's what I would be honest with you, I thought about it all week. I don't know what values I would say we had as I was a kid growing up in my family. Uh, whatever values we had, all I can tell you is they were broken values. They weren't really working. We should have traded them in for some new ones at some point, because it wasn't helping us get where we wanted to be as a family. And I grew up going in a direction that wasn't best for my life. And apart from even what God wanted for me, I even knew it wasn't best for my life. And then in my 20s, shortly after I got married, my wife and I decided, hey, let's, let's start going to church because I, I had seen some other people who, who were a part of a church who, 
who showed something different. So I wanted to start going. And, and here's what happened. After going for a short period of time, I went one day, and I think a lot of you can relate to this. I went back one day, and this time I was going to really listen. Because sometimes you can just go and you hear stuff. It's different when you really listen. And I went this day, and I said, I'm going to really listen. And, I, and I'll tell you, with everything in me, I swear that day, everything that pastor said, I felt like it was God just speaking right to me, like I was the only one in the room. And he's saying the same things I just said today. He's like, God loves you. He knows you. He's got a purpose for you. He has plans for your life. He's not done with you. It can be so much better. I am for you. I am with you. He's saying these things, and I'm hearing it, and I'm getting inspired, and I'm getting excited. And then I had this moment of, but I really believe that's for me. And then that day I said, you know what? I'm going to believe it is. I'm going to believe this is true for my life. And what we would call is I went on in that day. I, I looked at my wife. She's sitting right next to me. I said, this is it. This is what we're going to do. I don't, I don't think, if, if, if this is true, if what God says is true, there's no better way to live life. Let's, let's go for it. And she said, let's do it. And so we went all in that day. And I can tell you from that day forward, God's done an incredible work in my life. Done so much, more than, more than I ever expected he would do. I've never, I haven't been the same. He continues to work and grow on me and help me change and become more of who he wants me to be, the best version of me that I can be. He works on that constantly to help me with that. He's helped me impact others that I never thought I'd be a part of, impacting the lives of other people in the way that I have. But it all came down to I had to get to that moment where I go, okay, Jesus, I hear what you're saying, but do I really believe it? And in that moment, I said, I believe it. And from that day, everything changed. It changed everything. And that means I had to start trusting, I had to start trusting him more than anything else. And there were some things that I had to do different because of it. Because at the end of the day, what I learned very early on is he said, the best thing for your life, the best that will happen for your life is the more you can be like me is the best thing for your life, is what I learned early on. I said, okay, Jesus, help me be more like you. And I love what it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, so all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of God. Of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are being changed into His glorious image. I, in that moment, I was like, I, that season of life, I want to be more like you, Jesus. And I will tell you that if you know anything about Jesus, even if it's only what you've heard today, I think all of us would be able to say, I probably need to be more like Jesus. He says, that's what I want for you. I want to help change you more and more into the image of who I am, to be more and more like me. I didn't want to keep struggling with the things I was struggling with. I didn't want to keep missing out on what God would have for my life. And I didn't want to just stay where I was. I wanted to move forward in a direction that was better for me and my family. It was one of the first times in my life where I really was serious about God. I just want to grow and I want to be something more than what I am today. And he says, I got you. I got you. Which is why I love this next value that we talk about at Community Church is growing means changing. Growing means changing. Now I can tell you what's interesting about, about this, uh, <laughs> this particular value is if you know the rest of our values, if you've been around Community Church, you've probably heard of some of them before. I'll give you a couple examples if you don't know. Some of our values are love God, love people. Most people are like, I like that. Love God and you love people. That's a good thing. Speak life. Yeah, we should speak life. We should encourage one another. Hey, growing means changing. Oh God, we got to change? What's that about? Like, I mean, for some reason, this growing means changing has become the one value that seems to always get the uh, feeling every time you hear it. Opposed to others are like, yeah, that sounds great. We should do that. I can tell you that growing means changing has to be one of the values in your life if you're ever going to experience really what God wants to do in and through you for the rest of your life. Because I can promise you, every single one of us here today, every single one of you listening, we need to have some changes made in our life because none of us have arrived yet and we never will, but we can get closer and closer every day if we let Jesus do some things in us. Thank God I'm not the same person today that I used to be. Thank God I'm not the same person that I used to be. Thank God I'm not the same husband I was 18 years ago. That I'm a better husband to my wife. Today is 18 years. It's our anniversary. 18 years and counting. It's been awesome. 
I'm so thankful I'm not the same person I was when we got married. My wife is so thankful I'm not the same person I was when we got married. Here's what I would tell you about, about us being married. So here's how the story goes over and over again. People ask us about how we got together, and she talks about stuff. And here's, here's her common summary of our relationship. Yeah, when I met him, he was a fixer-upper. That's, that's how the story always begins. I was a, I was a fixer-upper. And so for 18 years, I've heard I was a fixer-upper. And so today, because I have the microphone, I'm going to tell you how the story really goes. <laughs> 18 years ago, when we, when we got married, I was a fixer-upper. <laughs> There was a whole lot of work needed to be done in me. I was not where I needed to be in any sense of the form. Uh, but thank God I captured this truth that God loves me in my heart and said, you know what, if you need to make some changes, you can make them. And it's helped me be a better husband every year along the way. It's helped me be a better dad every year along the way. It's, as my girls have grown up, I've gotten better at some things. God's worked in my heart. I, did, I used to struggle with some anger and, some, and not having enough patience in my life. Maybe some of you can understand that. And, and over time, I've, I've prayed and I sought God for that, and he's worked in my life, and he's helped me get better at those things. I got more patience than I've ever had. I've, you know, I, I'm able to have more self-control than I've ever had in my life. And my girls will be the first ones to tell you, I remember when. I'm so glad he's not like that anymore. I'm so glad I'm not the same person that I used to be. We hear growing means changing, and sometimes we have a negative connotation. I will tell you, if you've ever heard growing means changing, and it has sounded negative in your mind, or even if you've heard it for the first time today, and it comes across in a negative way, I will tell you, flip the script on that value, because it's one of the greatest ones you will ever experience if you start to live it out. You know, when my, when my daughter was probably about two years old, somewhere in that range, my wife and I had always heard, you know, raising kids can be tough. And, and at that point in, in, their, in their life, we, we had some conversations because we had other friends with young kids. And we're like, I don't know what we're doing, but we got this thing figured out. Like, we got this down. Like, this is easy. I mean, she's two. She never have a problem. Well, you know, just it's, this is pretty. And then we had more kids. <laughs> God set us up with the first one. Um, because the, the next one wasn't as quite as easy. But here's what I learned from that, right? Like, even though when I thought I was getting it right with her as a two-year-old, imagine she's 17 now that I still treated her the same way. Because I felt, hey, when, I was, when she was two, I got this. So I should just parent her this way for the rest of her life because this works really well. And now that you're 17, I'm just still going to treat you like a two-year-old. I can promise you, teenage girls are eat hard to raise. It doesn't go easy all the time. If you treat them like two-year-olds, it will get a lot worse really quick. <laughs> right? So things have to change as you grow, as, as people grow, as your family grows. Things have to change or it doesn't work very well. I would tell you, you're starting to raise the girls and get better at that. And then the boys came along. And then some of the issues with the boys, all kinds of issues. One of the biggest ones is their diapers. They would, their diapers would grow and, and it was important that we would change them. Um, because, because if not, it stinks and it, it, gets, it gets ugly real quick. And I would tell you, I think that's just a great uh, illustration, word picture, for us as people in life. That sometimes we're growing, but we're not changing, and we're just becoming a mess. Because we're not growing the way God's called us to. And he would say, I got, I've got it for you. I've got it figured out. I know who I want you to be, and if you would trust me, I would show you what that looks like. And growing means changing is so important to our lives. I, I'm thankful I'm not the same person I used to be, and I pray all the time that I won't be the same person I am today in six months, that I won't be the same person I am today in a year, and I won't be the same person a year from then, and I won't be the same person a year from then. Because I know while God has done so much in me and helped me be so much of a better version of me as I become more and more like him, I'm not there yet. The Bible says he's going to continue a work in us until, a day of, until the day of completion. Guess what? That day of completion doesn't come while we're still breathing on earth. We never arrive. We're always on this journey, but it can always get better. and He can always help us along the way if we will give him some space to do it. Imagine, imagine if we embrace this value as individuals. I want to grow. I want 
to be more like Jesus. God, do what you need to do in me to help me get there. What if we embrace that in our families? What if we embrace that fully as a church? Can you imagine over time how our community would be different as thousands become more and more like the face of Jesus each and every day? Here's what I want you to get from this. You can write this down if you're taking notes. Unlimited potential is released when God change occurs. Unlimited potential is released when God change occurs. Unlimited potential. Understand every single one of us have unlimited potential when we let God do some work in us. Ephesians 3, 20, 21, it says this, God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. I don't know what your wildest dreams are, but God wants to do more than that in your life. If you would just let him work in you a little bit. And and I've said this before over the years that, you know, growing up in a small town in North Carolina, in the country, that if you had told me at any point in my life growing up that one day I'd be speaking in front of thousands of people and saying something that's significant to their life that would help them live the best life that's possible for them, I'd probably thought you were crazy. But God had a wilder dream than I had for myself. I had dreams. None of them matched to the dream that God had. And it wasn't until I started trusting him with my life that I could start experiencing more of the plans that he had for my life. But sometimes I think we, we, we overdo it as well. Sometimes I think we're always looking for that like, major example in our life. And sometimes it's just so much simpler that when we let God start to work in our lives and change who we are, that he helps us every single day, even in the little things, see and understand the life he has for us and the difference it can make. I'll give you a good example. Uh, I told you we were dog sitting this past week and, uh, and, and of course he, he likes to jet out the door every chance he gets and not having dogs, we weren't used to this. So uh, my wife had the honor and privilege more often than I did to go chase him around the neighborhood and try to get him back into the house. And uh, so a couple days ago, this was happening where he jet out the door, one of the kids opened the door and he went running. She ends up about three blocks away chasing the dog down, trying to get him back, running all willy-nilly around the neighborhood. And uh, in that moment, if it had been me, I'm sure I would have been very angry and frustrated, and I don't know if the dog would have made it through the weekend. Um, However, my wife, who God's done a much better work in her than he's done in me at this point, right, was chasing the dog, and while she was a little bit frustrated while it was happening, she gets home, and I say something to her about it. She, I say, she goes, yeah, I was like three blocks away getting the dog again, but I'm back. I'm like, are you okay? Thinking she's probably frustrated. She goes, oh, yeah, it was cool, because while I was chasing the dog down, I met this person and this person. I have some new neighbors now. I didn't know them before, so we just hung out and talked for a little while. I invited them to church. I don't know if they'll come, but I asked them. I'm probably going to go see them again next week, and I'm just like, who lives this way, right? But, <laughs> but I can tell you, That when God changes your heart and starts to change who you are, you start to see things differently. And he helps us, he helps us live out the life he has for us and make more of a difference than we could ever imagine. I would tell you five minutes before all that happened, if I asked my wife, hey, what's your wildest dream today? That the dog would not run out of the house again. That was her wildest dream. Just the dog would not run out. But it turned into, no, I've met some new people. Hopefully I can gain some influence and build some new relationships because she's let God look at it, work in her life and show her new things. Second Peter gives us a good example of what God can do in us. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for a godly life. I just want to stop there for a second because often we can think, hey, I, I want to do good life God's way. I don't know if I can. What if I fail? What if I don't get it right? What if I'm not able to really do life the way God wants me to? I love that he tells us, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. In view of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance, patient endurance with godliness, godliness with brother affection, brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you, what's that word right there? No, the more you, right there, what's that word? Grow, Grow, right? Hold on, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, I look at that list and I'm going, there's a whole lot of work God still needs to do in my life. Because I could grow in a lot of those areas right now. And I'm not going to get there apart from him. 
And I got to be willing to say, God, I need you to help me get to where you want me to be, to be the best version of me that I can be, to use me in the ways that you want to use me. And then I go, why do so many people miss out on this? Why is it people can hear this truth that every number has a name and every name matters to God? That means you and that means me, that God sees us and he knows my name and he's calling us into a life with him, that he loves us, that he gave his life so that we could have life, right? If this is true and we hear that and that God wants to, by his divine power, these are all the things he can do in us that we can have by the fruit of the spirit, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If God can do all those things, then why do we still struggle to allow that to happen in our life? Why do we still go in different directions? And I look back at this story and I realize Ikea showed us even so much more than I thought I'd ever seen before because simply we don't always have the right view. We don't always have the right view. Here's what I want you to understand. A changed perspective can, re- can result in a changed life. A changed perspective can result in a changed life. Zacchaeus wanted a glimpse of Jesus, but he couldn't get one. It was too short. The crowd was too large. He understood if I want to see Jesus, I'm going to have to do something different. He, he made a decision that if I want a different result, then I have to make different choices. A lot of us need to understand that in our life. If I want a different result, I'm going to have to make some different choices in my life. And if I want to make the right choices, the best way I can do that is look at the person of Jesus and see what those choices should be. And he understood this. He changed his viewpoint. The crowd was too big. He couldn't see over them. He couldn't see around them. He couldn't see through them. And so he climbed a tree to get a different vantage point so he could see the Jesus he had heard so much about. And then I look at our lives and I go, so what's the problem with us? We're not standing in the midst of a crowd everywhere we go, but I can tell you there's plenty of things crowding out our life. There's plenty of things crowding out our life each and every day that keeps us from being able to see Jesus and the life that he has for us. What are, what, are, what are those crowds that you're dealing with every day? Zacchaeus, he, his crowd used to be money. Maybe it's for you, it's money. It's just, you're always thinking about money. You're always thinking about how can I get more and do I have enough and how can I hold on to what I have? Maybe for you, it's work and, and work is just crowding your day and your mind and your efforts and you can't function because of work. Maybe it's school for you and school is the crowd that you're dealing with. Maybe it's the crowd at school that you're dealing with that is getting in the way of you and Jesus and being able to see who he is and what he wants for your life. Maybe it's something so much simpler. Things we talk about, Netflix, music. It just crowds out your life. Social media, to where I couldn't see Jesus today because I spent hours doing this instead. And because I was caught up in this, I never got to see what Jesus wanted for me today. Here's the hard part. So often it's not even bad things. But when you get so many things, it becomes a crowd that blocks our view of the life that God has for us. And then there's so many people around us each and every day. Maybe you have a good view of Jesus. The people around you, do you see the things that are crowding their view of God? What can we do to help? What can we do to get over the hump and do what Zacchaeus did so we can see who Jesus is and have the encounter that he had and our life be changed because of it? If we want to see that happen, here's what you can write this down. We have to rise above the crowd. Grab hold of God's truth. And start experiencing more of the story God wants to write for everyone. You've got to rise above the crowd. Whatever that crowd is in your life, that may be keeping you from seeing Jesus each and every day and the life that he desires for you. Grab on to God's truth. What is his truth? We've been talking about it. That he loves you. That he is for you. He knows your name. He knows your name. You are the most important thing in the world to him. He says, I came and I gave my life. Why? So you could have life. So that forgiveness could be given for you. That you wouldn't have to worry about your past. I'll take care of that. I just want to help you with your future. You don't have to worry about the mistakes you've made. I was going to help you with the destiny that's coming. You don't have to worry about how you got it wrong. I'm going to show you how to get it right. That the truth is, I am for you. And because I'm for you, there's nothing you can't accomplish. And there are plans that I have for your life. There's a purpose that I had in mind when I created you. The Bible says before you were day old, I knew the plans I had for your life. If you would trust me, I would show them to you beyond your wildest dreams. That is the truth. When we embrace that, when we get a hold of that, then we can start experiencing more of the life God has for us. There's a story he wants to write for you. And there's a story he wants to write for the people around you. And we can help them with that. 
We gotta, get, we gotta rise above the crowd. Luke 19, that's where this story, Zacchaeus says, I wanna read verses three and four one more time. It says he tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road. You know what I love about that? He ran. He ran. Sometimes we overlook the simplest things. He ran. I want to see Jesus. I've heard a lot about him. There's a crowd. It's too big. It's in the way. If I want to see Jesus, I'm going to have to do something different. I'm going to have to change something in my life if I want to see what I'm really looking for in the life that I have. Because what Jesus is going this way, if I don't hurry up, I'm going to miss out. I don't want to miss out on what God's going to do. I'm going to run in the direction I need to run so I can get ahead of it, so I can experience all that he has for me. When you make the effort to move in the direction God wants you to move, I will tell you you'll have the same kind of encounter that Zacchaeus had. That when you encounter Jesus, your life will not stay the same. He encountered Jesus and that day he radically changed. And I will promise you, he has shown us truth in his word and in this story that when you make an effort to get closer to God, he will not waste your effort. He will not waste your time. He will show up in your life and he will stay true to his promises and you will experience a better life than you've ever known and you will see the people around you be impacted by it. It is life changing. It is life changing. He ran. We got to make a move so we can see Jesus and who he wants for our life. And then I go, so why don't we do it? Because if we want to grow, if we want to see this happen for our life, we got to change some things. And I've learned changing is hard. <laughs> Love is not like change. How many of you like change? Just, just be honest right now. You can go ahead. A lot. Yep, about four of you. <laughs> the rest of you are like, nope. <laughs> You're going to learn to love change you're going to see the results of it and the benefits of it. But why don't we change? Because we like comfortable. We like comfortable. Maybe if uh, you have small kids, you can relate. As I had my kids growing up, uh, they always had, one of them always had this outfit or this item that they always had to have, especially when they're really small. They cling to this one, maybe it's a blanket or something like that, that I'll wear this outfit every day. And if you ask me to change it, I'm going to lose my mind. If my blanket's not there when I go to sleep, we're all going to be up screaming the rest of the night, right? Like this. So I want to share with you real quick. Here's an example of maybe a little baby blanket. It's a little Minnie Mouse. It's cute. It's not mine. In case you're wondering. In case you're wondering, it's not mine. This is actually my daughter, Emily's. She's 17 now. She got this when she was born from a friend of ours to be her little sleep blanket. Uh, it worked. <laughs> because every night, until she was about three or so, if she didn't have this, she was not going to sleep. She got used to it. This was her, this was her little blanket. She loved her mini. And we always had to know where mini was because if we don't know where mini was, that caused tragedy in our life. <laughs> if you have little kids, you understand. And it didn't matter how much she slobbered on it or spit up on it, or drug it on the ground, or whatever, and got stuff on it, food caked in it, and everything else. She had to have Minnie with her when she went to sleep. And no matter how often we tried to get Minnie away so we could wash Minnie once in a while, because Minnie would get ragged and stank, right? Um, <laughs> stank's a word. Uh, there you go. Um, she wasn't having it. And there was times we'd leave it at grandma's house. You ever had the moment you left it at grandma's house? Grandma lives about an hour away, and you realize it's bedtime, and you're going... We can drive an hour to grandma's house and back, or we could all cry together for the rest of the night. <laughs> and so as parents, we had to make major decisions with our kids. And we drove to grandma's house every time because we needed some kind of sleep that night, right? And I go, why? No matter how dirty or filthy or nasty or just smelly this thing got, she could care less. As long as she had it, she was good. Anybody else would look at that and wouldn't want anything to do with it. You try to offer it to another kid, they're like, I don't want that. It's nasty. But she loved it. She wanted it with her all the time. Why? Because it was her thing. That's what she was used to. She didn't see all the other stuff. And then I wonder sometimes in our life, as God's trying to help us grow and be who he wants us to be, but we're too comfortable with where we already are, how often does everybody else see the things in our life that probably need to change with us? And anybody else can look at our life and go, yeah, man, there's some work you need to do. And you're like, what are you talking about? I'm good. And I would say right now, if that's, I would just challenge you right now in this moment. This idea of growing means changing. To really let God speak into your heart and go, are there some changes he needs to make? Are you too comfortable? 
And I pray that you get out of your comfort zone today and go, I want something better for my life. And the only way I'm gonna get that is through Jesus. I want something better. And when he captures my heart and shows me that he can offer me that, I want everyone around me to know it. And I wanna make sure they know he loves them too. And he's got something better for them. These values will change our life. They'll change the people around us. Zacchaeus wasn't even close to the same person he was when he first encountered Jesus. His whole family was changed. Every person he collected taxes with was changed. The community was changed because of this man's encounter with Jesus. How might we change in the people around us if we do the same thing? It all started with him deciding, I want to see Jesus today. And when he had that encounter, it was never the same. My prayer for you today is if you've never encountered Jesus, to understand the truth of the things we talked about today, that today you would go, I want this. If I have to run to get it, I will run to see what Jesus has for my life. I'm ready to trust him with everything that I have. God, show me the life you have for me. And if you're already a follower of Jesus, I pray you will embrace these values and make them your own in a way that you've never thought before and watch what God does with it. Would you close your eyes as we get ready to pray? And I just want to pray this morning, if you're here and you haven't already trusted Jesus with your life, and maybe you feel like maybe you're just kind of lost in the crowd of this world, that I want you to know, I want you to know Jesus sees you right now and he is calling you by name and he wants to share life with you. He wants to show you so much more for the days ahead. And so I'm going to pray. And if that's you, I want you to pray along with me. And if you've already gone all in, I want you to pray with me as well as we just declare some of God's truth in our life and what he's going to do in the days of head. So would you just say, pray with me. Jesus, today, I am going to trust you. I believe you are what I need for the best life I can have. I understand now Every number has a name, and every name matters to God. I want to help others know it too. I know growing means changing, and I'm ready for what you need to do. I believe because of these things, my best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen.